Okay, today we are going to be talking about my all-time favorite biological macromolecule, deoxyribonucleic acid, otherwise known as DNA. Now, we know as you know, freshmen, sophomores in high school, that DNA is the carrier of genetic information. But for a long time, scientists didn't know that. For many years, scientists thought that proteins were the carriers of genetic information. So it's important before we start talking about the details of DNA to just take a look at the history of how we know what we know today about this amazing macromolecule. So we're going to start by talking about a scientist named Frederick Griffith in the 1920s. And he was really interested in looking at the type of bacteria that cause pneumonia. So he took two different strains of pneumonia, grew them in his lab, and then injected them into mice. And one of those strains was a smooth strain, and one of those strains was a rough strain. When he injected the smooth strain into a mouse, the mouse died. So that meant that that strain of bacteria actually caused the disease. When he injected the rough strain into a mouse, the mouse lived, which meant that it was a non-disease causing strain. So he asked himself, well, what happens if I take that disease causing strain and I heat kill it? So he heat killed it over a Bunsen burner and then injected that into a mouse and the mouse actually lived. So that meant that the bacteria had been killed, they no longer could cause the disease. Then he asked himself, well what if I t heat kill the disease causing strain, but then I also mix that heat killed strain with the non-disease causing strain. So the disease causing strain had been heat killed and he was mixing it with a non-disease causing strain so he assumed that the mouse was going to live. But as it turned out, the mouse actually died. So he came to this conclusion that bacteria, living organisms, could somehow pass information from one to another. We call this transformation, this exchange of genetic information. And what he realized was that the non-disease causing strain was sort of exchanging genetic information with the heat killed disease causing strain and it was ultimately becoming a disease causing strain. So that process is called genetic, uh, sorry, transformation and this is all number one on your notes organizer. <clears throat> Okay, but scientists, you know, this is the 1920s, they're still not convinced. They're saying, no way that it's DNA, it's got to be proteins. So Oswald Avery was basically responsible for repeating Griffith's work. He did this in 1931, and he identified the actual molecule that transformed the R strain or the rough strain into the smooth strain was actually DNA. So he, he was repeating Griffith's work to determine which molecule was responsible for transformation, and he ultimate, ultimately concluded that the molecule was DNA. So Oswald Avery was really the first scientist to say, I think the carrier of genetic information is DNA. But this, the scientists at this time, like I said, they really weren't convinced. It wasn't until Hershey and Chase, Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase came along where you really couldn't deny anymore that it was not proteins and that it was in fact DNA that carried genetic information. Okay, so these two scientists, they studied viruses, which technically aren't living organisms, um, but they, can't, they do carry genetic information which can be injected into living organisms. So they studied viruses also known, or the, the type of virus that they study is also known as a bacteriophage because it specifically injects its DNA into bacteria. Oh, okay, so ultimately Hershey and Chase were trying to determine which part of the virus injected itself into the cell of a bacteria. Because a, a virus basically consists of two parts. You have the protein coat on the outside and then the genetic information in the inside. So they grew viruses, and this sounds very complicated, but once you see the picture, I don't think you'll think that. They grew viruses in two different types of chemicals. One in a radioactive phosphorus chemical and one in a radioactive sulfur. And Phosphorus and sulfur actually attach to different parts of the virus. So radioactive phosphorus, think of it as sort of like a marker that makes different parts glow. The radioactive phosphorus actually attached itself to the DNA or genetic information inside the virus. So think about it as like glowing DNA. The radioactive sulfur attached itself to the protein of the virus. So they, they said whatever gets left inside the bacteria cell, either the phosphorus or the sulfur, we can ultimately figure out what carries the genetic information. So we know that when the virus 
attached itself to a bacteria, it injected its genetic material, which is happening right here. Remember that genetic material was marked with radioactive phosphorus. When the bacteria or the virus that had the radioactive sulfur attached itself to a bacteria, the glowing part remained on the virus because it was attached to the proteins. So Hershey and Chase were able to realize that it was DNA that was being injected from the virus to the bacteria because we had the radioactive phosphorus glowing on the DNA. Okay, so this is all number three on your notes organizer. Like I said, it sounds very complicated, but, but it really isn't. Okay, so let's summarize this. Viruses are grown in a medium containing radioactive phosphorus to label the DNA. Viruses are grown in a medium containing radioactive sulfur to label the protein. They are grown in a sample mixed with bacteria. The viruses inject the bacteria, injecting their genetic material into the bacteria. And you basically find radioactive bacterial cells in the phosphorus test tube, but you don't find radioactive bacterial cells in the sulfur test tube, which means that DNA was the material injected and not proteins. So ultimately their conclusion was that viral DNA was injected into the cell and provided the genetic information needed to produce new viruses. So now that we have this information, DNA is the macromolecule which carries genetic information. No one could deny that any further. It was not proteins. Now we had to figure out what is the structure of this amazing macromolecule. So in come the scientists that were discussed in the movie that we watched in class. The first scientist is a guy named Erwin Shargoff and he studied the four nitrogen bases C, G, T, and A and those stand for cytosine guanine, adenine, and thymine. So Chargoff studied the nitrogen bases and he basically realized that no matter what type of living organism he was looking as at, the percentages of guanine and cytosine were almost always equal. They were very, very close. And then the percentages of adenine and thymine were almost equal in every single sample of DNA. So what do you think is the conclusion that we could draw from that? If guanine and cytosine are always equal in amount and adenine and thymine are always equal in amount, what can we assume about, about those pairings? That in a molecule of DNA, those pair together. Okay, so cytosine always pairs with guanine, adenine always pairs with thymine. And this is because we have nitrogen bases called pyrimidines and purines. And here's the way that I remember which is which. Pyrimidine has the letter Y in it. The nitrogen bases that are pyrimidine are thymine and cytosine. Okay, so the, the nitrogen bases that have Ys are pyrimidines, and then the other ones are purines, so adenine and guanine. You can also remember that thymine and cytosine are the long nitrogen base names, and pyrimidines is the long nitrogen base names. Pyrimidines are single ring bases. You can see here, you have your ring of uh, a molecule ring. And then purines are double ring bases. A single ring base always attaches itself to a double ring base. So a pyrimidine always pairs with a purine. So that makes sense. I mean, look here, thymine and adenine always pair together. Cytosine and guanine always pair together. So a pyrimidine always pairs with a purine. So this is all number four on your notes organizer. And this brings us to my all-time favorite scientist, which is Rosalind Franklin. And one of the reasons I love Lo Rosalind Franklin is because she was a brilliant female scientist in a time when um, science was really dominated by males. And so despite the fact that her work was so uh, legendary, she really didn't get credit for her work. And ultimately, she died from her work without getting any sort of real recognition for it. Okay, so Rosalind Franklin was working with a process called x-ray diffraction. And x-ray diffraction literally means that you are bending x-rays around something. And in this case, she was bending x-rays around the molecule of DNA and taking a picture of it. And this is the picture that she got right here. This is Rosalind Franklin's famous photo 51. 
And it wasn't until this picture was taken that we figured out the structure of DNA. We really had no idea what shape this molecule even was. So by looking at this picture, scientists could determine that DNA must be spiraled. That's why we call it a double helix, because it has sort of two spirals spiraling around each other. That makes up a molecule of DNA. Okay, so she, this is number five on your notes organizer. She used x-ray diffraction, and ultimately her picture, her photo 51, allowed us to determine that um, DNA existed in this double helix or spiral shape. So like in the movie talked about, Watson and Crick were this very, you know, young sort of group of scientists that no one really expected to do anything. And they really took the work of other scientists and put it together. They didn't really do any experimentation of their own. But they were ultimately the first to build an accurate model of deoxyribonucleic acid. And they really took Rosalind Franklin's photo 51 without her permission and used it to put all the pieces of the puzzle together in this sort of double helix shape. Okay, so they built a model that conformed to the other's research. Model was a double helix. It had a backbone, or the rails of our twisted ladder were made of sugars and phosphates that fit with others' research. And then they had base pairs attached in the middle that made up sort of the steps or the rungs of the ladder. And they did them in this way. They attached to the deoxyribo, which is the sugar, and they had them so that A and T were always paired together and C and G were always paired together. Okay, so like this is just summarizing what I just said. DNA is often compared to a twisted ladder, a double helix twisted ladder. The rails of the ladder are basically made up of alternating sugars and phosphate, sugars being the deoxyribose, ribose, sucrose, fructose, glucose, okay, all those are sugars. So this is a five carbon sugar that alternates between a, pho a phosphorus, a phosphate. So you have the phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, the nitrogen bases attached to the sugar, and they are always in pairs. Cytosine and guanine are always paired together, adenine and thymine are always paired together, and that's what makes up the steps of our ladder. Okay, so this is number seven on your notes organizer. They discovered that there must be these hydrogen bonds that form between the adenine and thymine and the cytosine and guanine or the purine paired with the pyrimidine and that the different pairings have different numbers of hydrogen bonds. So adenine and thymine have two hydrogen bonds between them. Cytosine and guanine have three hydrogen bonds between them. It's all about the way that the molecules are sized and how many bonds required are required for them to hold together. But remember, what did we learn about hydrogen bonds? They're very weak interactions, which means they can be easily what? Easily broken. That is going to be a big key concept when we talk about uh, DNA replication. Okay, so two hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine, three between cytosine and guanine. In other words, a pyrimidine is always paired with a purine. Here's our structure of DNA. We learned back when we talked about macromolecules that nucleotides are the monomers of our deoxyribonucleic acid polymers, so the little parts that get put together to make the big molecule. And a nucleotide consists of three parts a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base. So that little subunit repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats, and that's what ultimately makes up a molecule of DNA. Okay, so let me repeat that. A sugar, a phosphate, a nitrogen base, and the nitrogen base is always attached to the sugar. Okay, so I'm going to, okay, so I am going to stop here for this part. Part two will have the answers to eight through 10 on your notes organizer. Have a great day.